Welcome to the show, folks. This is Wrestling Changed My Life. Here we go. You know, because 2014, I was so young and so like almost didn't really understand that like I deserve to be here. Like I made the team, but I just felt like, oh, I'm 20, I'm 21 years old. You know, I'm fresh out of junior. I was like, what can I do here? And I wish, you know, if I could go back, I wish I would tell myself all these things of like, why are you, why are you caring what anybody thinks? Like, why do you care? You know, like you just have to stay, you know, like so present, like don't miss the opportunity. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort it humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gents, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is your host, Ryan Warner. I'm back from my week of travels down to Stillwater and excited to bring you this episode. My guest today is Jenna Burkett three-time world team member hailing from Rocky Point, New York. She now wrestles for the Army WCAP program. Awesome conversation here. I hope you enjoy it, folks. Coming tomorrow is our 90-minute interview with John W. Smith, the one and only. I can't wait to share it with you guys. Fan of the week goes to Brian Medlin, Illinois RTC head coach, one of the best in the game. Brian, can't wait to have you on the show. And folks, this episode is brought to you by the Wrestling Change My Life online store. Please go to store.wrestlingchangemylife.com to shop Wrestling Change My Life t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. That's it, folks. Let's give it up for Jenna Burkett. Jenna Burkett, welcome to the podcast. Heck yeah, thanks for having me on. It's an honor. A lot of places we could start, as I say, every interview, but one I'm really excited about. I heard you have a crazy story about the World Military Games in Lithuania. Oh. Or, is that right? Is it Lithuania? <laughs> it was, yeah, Lithuania, 2017. What happened there? Let's start there. Uh, that's funny. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of all over the place. I mean, when you go to the military world championships or the world games, it's not like a traditional world championships in the sense that um, Team USA has you like housed in a separate hotel and things like that. Everyone's in the same barracks. But because the men's team is significantly more weights than the women's, it, the men's team was all together. So like Team USA Greco and men's freestyle was all together. And the women, there wasn't enough of us because I think it was like only four weight classes for that event. So we were all roomed bunk to bunk with all the foreigners. And I was just like, you know, I had no idea. That was my first uh, world championships for the military side. And I had no idea what to expect. Um, and so it was just a very funny interaction, like literally sleeping head to head next because the bunks are all closely staggered next to each other. And you'd be like using your phone charger and I would, I would wake up and my phone would be completely dead. And the, the foreigners, like they would literally just take the phone charger. And I was like, oh, this is going to get old quick. <laughs> yeah. I like, I had it plugged in and then it went like missing. And I was like, okay, I'm going to like, kick some ass before I even start wrestling because I'm like I, I need my phone <laughs> and then I look in and like the Mongolians walking in from another room with it and I'm like looking at her like um do you know that's mine <laughs> so it was uh just a very funny eye-opening experience but nonetheless great competition I wrestled the reigning world champ from Mongolia like my second match and it was like you know I think not many people realize that the military world games has the exact same people as the world championships. <laughs> See, I didn't know that. Is that, is it that way for every country when it comes to freestyle? 
You know, I think it's because it's a lot of the way they get their funding or their their military service is built into being a citizen in these countries. So mm -hmm. you have to serve two years in, in some of the countries. And so I, you know, like the German team, it's not necessarily mandatory, but I know a lot of them opt for it because it's a good financial situation for them. It's like the same, somewhat of the same gig as here. Uh, I just like, we get paid to wrestle, right? We're on orders to be a part of the world-class athlete program, but we're also trained in our MOS and trained as a soldier so that when we're done wrestling, we can go do that. But I don't know necessarily how much these guys are trained in that type of realm. So I'm not trying to dog on their military career by any means. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. But, you know, it's either a financial gain or they have to do it. But yeah, you end up getting a lot of great competition i mean i think the year that uh Jermiel byers i believe he when he won the world championship he actually lost the military world games that same year so it just shows like the level of you know intensity and skill at, at the games for sure and then you know when you talk about the mongolians stealing your charger do they steal your phone too or just the charger just the charger yeah okay. i don't <laughs> <laughs> i was a little skeptical it was i'm telling you it was so funny they were like they would leave their like trash in the middle of the of the room it's just like it was eye-opening because we all have different you know culture experiences so, like i i don't know i can't speak on what they do over there it wasn't sure. like they were intentionally trying to be like messy but for us it's like well if there's a banana peel in the center of the room like that's got to go like there's gonna be flies you know like um and that's just kind of how we handle business on that sort of thing. But it was funny. And then I couldn't take the smell of the room because it was all these girls, everybody different odors. And I found like a, uh, like an overseas version of Lysol. And I just came into the room and I was spraying it. And the, <laughs> some of the other countries, like those girls were pissed and they were staring at me and the team USA girls are like dying. And I'm like, I'm not backing down with this can of Lysol. Like it's going. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. I mean, it's cool to think that it's a different experience and at the World Championships where everybody's in their hotel and everyone's pretty serious, pretty tense. I'm sure there's that same focus and intensity there, but was there any opportunity to have meals with other teams and hang out with other teams or was it all business? Definitely. Um, so after the event's over, like the military world, you're there for a good amount of time, right? Because you've got all the different styles, all the different weight classes. And then there's like two a lot of days to like go and tour Lithuania and you're just roaming around with your competition. So it was a really cool experience afterwards to kind of just like talk to them. The, I, I think it was Belarus. They were like dogging me for my laugh because it's pretty obnoxious. And I was like, dang, I was like, <laughs> my laugh's even annoying international. <laughs> <laughs> That's a global, uh, global assumption there that the laugh is, is yeah. loud. Um, definitely what is the what is the army uh is it the wcap program yes, yes. what is, what is that because i know ellis coleman's in it he's an illinois guy um you know i know some guys who coached him in high school but yeah. is it similar to like an rtc type of thing in the sense that you're a pro wrestler during the day so in a sense yeah similar you know you're getting paid to wrestle that's what you're on orders for uh, the goal of the World Class Athlete Program is to have the best people um, be not only athletes, but to be soldiers. And so it goes hand in hand being a good wrestler. To me, it, it translates immediately to being a good soldier and, you know, mm -hmm. excelling in that realm. And so they want us to produce world and Olympic medals. And then they want us to go. And when we go to our military schools, they want us to excel there as well. So in instead of like just getting paid to wrestle, we have military obligations right so we do that sort of thing we're all certified in our mos and um so during the day you have to do that or only when you're done wrestling you have to do military obligations kind of both so we stay up to date on all our trainings throughout the day so that can you know you could be working on a computer or doing things like that throughout your whole day in between practices um just to make sure you're getting them in by the deadlines um and then you still like you have to fit in your military schools in between your you know your competition season like you know last year before my wrestle off you know i was coming off of like when i wrestled helen i was coming off of only three weeks being back on the mat because i had a month and a half at my military school so that's just kind of like the you just got to roll with the punches you know i knew for me i wanted to go to my military school right after world championships but right after the world's was my wedding and then I had time off. So it just didn't fit in the schedule. And so I had to go at this certain time. Um, 
And so it left, and I wasn't completely aware that we're going to have this sudden wrestle off, you know, it's not like the men's freestyle had that. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't in the training schedule ahead of time. And that's just kind of what it was like, okay, well, my military obligation comes first and then, you know, rest are second. So, you know, so, and that was kind of the deal. And like, I've, you know, Whitney Condor, when she went to her MOS school to be, you know, a staff sergeant, she went, I think right before the nationals. And so sometimes it just falls like that and you got to roll with the punches, but at the end of the day, we get paid to wrestle and it's, I wouldn't trade it for anything. You know, if I have to miss a few weeks to go um, get certified in a different area to keep up with my uh, trainings and all that, then it's, it's well worth it. And what about when you're done wrestling? What does life look like for you in the military then? I think it uh, depends on how long your contract is, right? So some people can align that perfectly where they, when they're done wrestling, their um, military enlistment contract is coming to an end. So for some people, it works out like that. Uh, I just personally re-enlisted and so I'm re-enlisted until 2024. So that holds me over nice too. If I want to, you know, continue wrestling and go another Olympic games, mm -hmm. or if I want to stop wrestling and go do my MOS. So I think it depends on the person, you know, if some people are in that mindset of like, Oh, I just want to wrestle and that's all they want to get out of it. Then that's for some people and they'll get out. Um, I think a lot of people will, stay in you know we've got a few people that are switching from being an enlisted soldier to going the officer route so i think it just depends on like what your goals are and how long your contract is this is a noob question what is mos gotcha okay so that's it's just <laughs> what your um like what your job is so for me my mos okay. is a uh, 92 yankee so i'm a unit supply specialist so that's that's my uh, mos yeah got it shout out uh, to my cousin he's in the national guard i know he's probably listening and wondering how could you not know that but uh, uh i had to uh, had to ask so for sure you had a you know a really unique high school experience in a sense that you went to school in michigan and got to work with a guy by the name of shannon gillespie Heck what yeah. impact did he have on you Oh man, I, I could talk about Shan Man, uh, you know, till the day is done. He he truly, truly took my career um, from one level and made me jump three levels. And it wasn't just the like technique side of things. He's a huge, huge proponent of the mental side of wrestling, and that was just very, very new to me. You know, I came from, uh, you know, I wrestled in New York. I have a great room of wrestlers. They all went on to do incredible things, and so it was a very competitive room. But it was. Uh, a room in the mindset of like, Hey, you, you know, you suck right now. You better get better. Like you better do this. Like looking a little fat, you got to do this. And for me, it just, it didn't fit my personality, you know? And then when I met Shannon and coach Tony Deanna, they were just all about, you know, like what you tell yourself matters. And so once I kind of like understood that and really, you know, cause you got to buy in, you can listen to your mm -hmm. coach say whatever, but if you don't buy in and think that this is the guy that believes in me. This is the guy that's going to take me to the next level. You know, you're probably not going to reach those goals. And so Shannon has done incredible things. I mean, there's so many people that he had impacted, impacted, you know, there was like, I think it was 2014, our world team, uh, how many weights was it? Maybe seven at the time. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was like five out of the seven came from Northern Michigan at the USOAC program. So I got that great experience with great coaching staff. And, you know, my first year, my team was made up of like Helen, uh, Veronica Carlson, Adeline Gray, Aaron Golston. You know, it was an insanely competitive room. Was it so hard I, being away from home that early? Oh my God, it destroyed me. Yeah, it was really rough. It just, you know, it was like a whole different culture. You know, I was so used to growing up in New York. It's just like the attitude's a certain way, you know, you dress a certain way to keep up. And when I moved to Marquette, Michigan, it was like, I had no idea what to expect. And, you know, it's freezing cold up there. It, when I moved there that first year, that was actually the coldest winter on record in like 10, 10 years. And that was just my intro to this. So I just thought that was the norm. And there's never any sun. So the more just piles on the snow, you know, it just stays. I mean, like you're from uh, Illinois. So you yeah. like, you would totally at, how far north is marquette michigan because i didn't think it'd be that much colder than new york but i guess oh so and i'm from long island too so i'm not from upstate so i'm so far on the island so far east okay i'm looking so, yeah. at the map now here oh it's <laughs> way up there it's in the up yeah yeah yep the upper peninsula for holy sure holy shit like that's you're a boat right away from canada okay i didn't know where it was at exactly yeah <laughs> so how old it, were you when you went there the first I, time I was 15 when I first moved there. Yeah. 
Oh my God. I can't think of a bigger culture shock than going from, you know, Long Island to the UP. UP. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It is so funny, you know, because you just like, I think when I moved there, I told myself like, Hey, if you hate it in a few months, you'll just go home. You know, like that's, that's just, we'll just go there for this experience. And then when I got there and I absolutely hated it and I was like, well, there's no way I can leave. Like I can't quit. I can't be that person. And so I was like, well, I got to see this, this through, you know? And so it was a huge culture shock just to be away from my parents. I was, you know, my brother, my parents, it was so difficult, but I, I kind of gra- like had to get into the routine of like, my parents came and saw me a lot, you know? So by the time I moved there, you know, it was like a month and then it was Thanksgiving. So I was home and then it was Christmas. And I, like, I always flew home for that. I don't know how my parents swung it because Marquette to New York was an expensive uh, plane trip. What airport is there up there? Oh my goodness. I can't remember the airport. It's been so long. I'm looking at, I swear to God, I've never seen a city so remote in my life. I'm looking at this map. It's just surrounded by green, like national park forest preserve. Absolutely beautiful. Don't get me wrong. I bet. It's incredible, but it's like incredible for a month. Like it's, I feel like summer's one month and then it's winter. <laughs> so you, you just mentioned that, you know, at first you were incredibly homesick and then you said you have to see this through. You said that in about five seconds, but I'm guessing in real life, it was a matter of days, weeks, or months. How long did that process take for you from when you went there to accepting and really buying in? Um, yeah, so I, it definitely took a few months I think but when I went to like a national championship, so that was probably around March typically. So it took, you know, probably five months or four or five months. And then, you know, I think I won that nationals and I was like, wow, things are really like paying off, you know, like I'm starting to really understand and my parents are visiting me. So I'm still seeing them. You know, I honestly saw my parents and my family once a month at least. Um, and then I think was key was making friends in the school, you know, because those are the people I was with, you know, I had practice at five in the morning, then we had to walk to the local high school about a mile and a half. And we'd be in high school all day, a full schedule. And then after we got out of school, we would ride our bikes and take the bus and get back to the dome so that we could get our next training session in. And then, you know, we had homework and, all, you know, typical stuff, but it was just, you know, you were expected to be at a higher level because we're with college girls and only there was only five of us that were in high school and that was Helen, Veronica, Adeline, myself and Erin Golston and so those girls were three years older than us so they had a lighter schedule because they didn't have to be at school all day and so we were stuck the full you know seven eight hours so it was it was very difficult and I think it was super important for me to make friends with people in that school and that just kind of happened. It took, it took about a year, I swear. I really felt like it. And once I made those friends and bought into like, wow, these people, because the school is super supportive. You know, they, they love their athletes. This is, this is a high school that has not only um, wrestling, but it had speed skating and it had weightlifting and boxing. So we're talking about a school that had Apollo Ono, you know, so this school, mm. they love their athletes and they cherish them. So once I was around that environment of, wow, this whole team supports me, you know, I would like everyone in my, in my area is rooting for me. I, you, you buy into that kind of lifestyle. So is the whole high school, a normal high school or, Mm -hmm. oh, so, so, so you're literally going to a normal high school up there. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty unique. How, how many of the students, cause that's where the Greco program is at too, right? Yes. So how many of the students there, you said five, um, five on the women's team were in high school, but if you go to the high school itself, would you say 95% of the population is just normal people who live there or athletes who have transferred in or? I, I, I don't know if I can give an exact percentage. Or really no, that's okay. Because yeah. like I'm thinking about it because it wasn't just, so it wasn't just, you know, like wrestling because wrestling had high schoolers, speed skating had high schoolers and that was it because okay. it's hard to get people to buy into this. You know, it's a, it's a huge, huge life changing uh, thing for yourself. So and you got to be the right kind of person, you know, you got to be the person that's going to buy into it and not get in trouble and do the right things, you know? Sure. So it wasn't that many, but there were incredible hockey players that came. And so I, I can't even think of the name of their like high school hockey program or their traveling league. I couldn't tell you any of that, but I do know that they were incredible. And most of those guys went on and played hockey for D1 programs. Northern Michigan is a D1 hockey program. So it not only had wrestlers that left home it had hockey players so it was a very um so aside from those two groups everyone else was just you know normal high school students and they had like 
these, you know, random athletes. And I remember in high school, it was just so funny because I remember sitting like, you know, at lunch and I was like, oh, hey, Lauren, like, I won't see you tomorrow. And they're like, oh, where are you going to be? And I was like, oh, I'm going to be, I'll be in Sweden tomorrow. And they're, they're, they would just crack up and they're like, Jenna, like, you're leaving the country tomorrow and you're just going to say that casual, like you're, you're going away <laughs> for the weekend. <laughs> what would your international funny. travel schedule be when you were at that program? A couple trips a year? Definitely. Yeah. So we had a couple scheduled tours a year. Uh, it was like, we would go to Austria. We went to Japan. Uh, I would say those are probably our two big tours, but then you got to factor in if you made a junior world team, you're going there. Uh, one year, uh, Terry Steiner called Shannon was like, Hey, send these guys to Sweden. So we ended up having three tours that year. Hmm. And then you got to mix in. We still have to remain competitive in the high school realm. You know, some of the seniors like Adeline and Helen, they didn't go to like, you know, the folk style nationals because they were competing at the senior level, mm -hmm. whereas we were still sophomores in high school. So we had to, you know, still remain competitive with our high school peers and go to folk style nationals and go to body bar and do all that. So, I mean, honestly, I remember traveling, you know, once a month. I remember it was very, it was hard. You know, it was, that was another reason why it was so crucial to have those friends to be like, hey, what did I miss? You know, I've been in Austria for two weeks. <laughs> Crazy. What a unique opportunity, though. Oh, for sure. I, like, I know a lot of people, you know, they always say like, I could never let my son or daughter do that. And, and while I totally understand, like, I don't even have kids yet, but one day, you know, I, I can't even imagine that feeling of being like, yeah, I'm just going to let you go. Um, but I'm so thankful to my parents for letting me take that opportunity because it really, it was so important for my wrestling career, but more importantly, it was super important for my personal life. You know, it was just a really an opportunity for me to grow and um, get to know this small town. And it was, it definitely changed who, you know, who I am and, and for the better, in my opinion, I started to realize, you know, like the values of life and why it's so important to do things outside of wrestling. Cause you just, you'll burn out. Well, and like you said, being around someone for the first time and Shana Gillespie that actually believes, you know, anything is possible is, mm -hmm. excuse me. Cause we've all had those coaches where they're more realistic and, you know, they're not, you know, dreamers, so to speak, and they have limiting beliefs. But first yeah. time you're around someone like that who really believes you could do anything, that is an incredible feeling. Um, the one thing you mentioned, though, in a, in a past article that I found was you realize that it's okay not to feel, you know, super confident every day, which yeah. that's something I still battle with now. Sometimes yeah. I get up and, you know, I'm just not feeling it and I get so frustrated with myself. But, you know, how did you come to that self discovery? I think it was all in the process of just not identifying as I'm a wrestler 24 seven. I think once I started to buy into that, I have to be a person. I have to have goals outside of wrestling. I have to have friends outside of wrestling. It made me just start to understand that like life just, you know, you have these ups and downs and it's, it's very natural. And I try to, you know, preach to the kids and whomever that it's just like, it's really truly okay to not be okay. You know, some days I feel like I'm attacking life and I can do everything. And, you know, some days it's an absolute struggle, but I think it's so important to have the right network of people around you who can like identify when you, maybe you're not truly yourself. And I think, um, you know, like my coach Jermaine Hodge now at the army world-class athlete program, he's just been a huge role model in my life and truly keeps me like on the right track. But it's always because it's so much more than wrestling, you know, like he's been just insanely important to my career because, you know, I would have all these anxieties and all this nerves and I wouldn't know what to do with it. And one of the simplest things he said to me one year was just, well, let me carry it. Like I'll, I'll put it in my ruck, you know, like I'll carry your stress. And I remember just thinking like, Oh my God, like just that phrase alone made me like breathe like easier. Like, okay, I don't have to carry all this stress, you know, because my coach is going to carry it. So now all I have to do is wrestle. Like, how easy is that? Do you have anything you do the day of or before a match? Any routines to get yourself in the right place or to release that stress? Um, so It's okay if not. I was just wondering, you know. No, yeah. I was talking about this with my neighbors the other day. They're completely not wrestlers. And so I've just been, you know, chatting them up about different things. And I was telling them that one of the things that I do before, like the night before my matches usually, and not every competition, but usually the bigger competitions, I watch this episode on Chef's Table and it's with uh, Christina Tosi and she runs the uh, Milk Bar. And I watched this episode on Netflix and it was like the 
ultimate pump up to me. Like I just really like grasped to it and was in like loving it. You know, just, she came from like a family that was really wanted her to get her college education and she did that. And, you know, I can't remember what her degree is, but I, I want to say accounting, but I don't think that's accurate, but she was doing this life and it just wasn't truly for her. And she really wanted to be like this baker. And, you know, her parents were like, how, how are you going to make a living, you know, being a baker? Like, come on. And she was just I so I hate people motivated. like that, by the way. Yeah, parents that say, And they don't mean any harm by it because they're just trying to look out for you. But I hate when I hear stories like that. I just, I'm so glad that you found something that kind of inspires you to think the other way. Keep going though. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. No, it was just like so funny. And like, because it's true. Like you, you want to a little bit please your parents and do the right thing. And like, yeah, I want the stable job versus the ups and downs. Who knows what's going to happen? And it was just crazy. Like she was working in New York city, you know, hustled and bustled and made, made it happen. And now like milk bar is insanely popular. It's great desserts. And I was watching this and I was like so motivated from it. And I literally now nights before my big competition, I'll just turn it on because the way they do it on Netflix is like just so motivating. You're, you would actually think it's like a, like a sports video or something. And I had Mensa watch it actually before she wrestled at Worlds, and she won Worlds, So that's, that's all I got to say. I'm definitely going to watch it now while we're yeah. on the, while we're on the topic, I noticed you're a fan of Grey's Anatomy. Have you watched Lennox Hill? No, I haven't. It's an incredible, my brother makes fun of me for watching it and he's going to give me a hard time because he listens to all these, but it's uh, so my girlfriend is a physician assistant okay. and I'm trying to understand her world a little bit. And yeah. so we watched Lennox Hill, which is uh, it's, it's a real world documentary of this hospital in New York. And it's Ooh. crazy. It's I will awesome. definitely check that out. Did you say it was on Netflix or did you say it was on? Okay. It is on Netflix. Yeah. I'll definitely watch that. Yeah. Big Grey's and that big, like Shonda Rhimes fan in this house. Like (laughs) I'm a sucker for scandal, how to get away with murder. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not, I, uh, I enjoy it myself a little bit. I'm a little bit of a drama guy, so I'll admit it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Right on. (laughs) Um, one of the things I found that was pretty cool was that you are, or, or did work with Adidas to design a, a woman singlet. How did that come about and are you still working with them? Um, so it, it was just, you know, over the years we constantly get issued, women constantly get issued gear that it's like baggy, you know, fighter shorts, baggy long sleeves. And over the course of years, a USA Wrestling and the women's team have constantly been working like, okay, we really need clothing. Like we need spandex. Like we want, you know, clothes that fit us basically. Yeah, so we sure. can feel comfortable and wrestle better, right? Blah, blah. And we've had a big issue with our singlets just either – Um, you know, not full coverage, it pulls down, you can, we've had so many see-through singlets that I I can't, I think I went through a whole, I'm so serious. I think I went through an entire decade long of USA wrestling singlets for worlds and juniors and all this stuff of literally see-through singlets. (laughs) And it was just, you know, like it became ridiculous and we were all frustrated. And then um, I started working with Adidas and that was through Sally Roberts. She knew people at Adidas and I just was like, yeah, I would love to help just, you know, make things better. Like I would love to just, you know, because it became a lot of, you know, months of just like getting uh, mock-ups and trying it and critiquing the heck out of them being like, this needs to come up. The material needs to change. We need to fix this here. Uh, especially like on most women's hat, like women just have like bigger and stronger like thighs. And so it had to be comfortable there. And mm-hmm. so it was just so um, important for the women's community to have single that fit. And Adidas, I was grateful to them and, you know, they were super kind and we just worked together on, you know, giving feedback to each other. And I think the honest criticism is what really helps. Cause I think sometimes like women in general, you know, we, we get given something and we're like, Oh, it's good. And then like behind the doors, we're like, actually, I wish it was this, this and that. And, and Adeline is a huge person that I've really, you know, been around her for years. And she's the person that if it's not right, it's not right. She's not going to tell you that it's okay. She's going to tell you straight up, this is horrible. Fix it. Like that's who Adeline is. And when you're around people like that and you're like, you know what, actually like we really do deserve singles that fit us right. We should give the correct feedback so that we can, we can all learn. And I think if you're uh, a company or a person or a coach that has humility that you can be like, you know what, you're right. This isn't the best. And if a female is telling me that there can be improvement, there can be improvement, you know? So grateful for that. And hopefully the women who've, you know, worn the singlets, they've all gave good feedback and I hope they're being honest, but if there's any improvements in any brand, you know, I think women need to use their voices and just, you know, go about it the right way. And, you know, we can all work to improve things. Cause I I know it sounds like simple, like, well, it's a singlet, but like 
most girls, when they start wrestling, they're wearing boy singlets. Like I can't tell you the amount of times I had to have a t-shirt under my singlet mm. when I'm like seven years old, you know, it's like, obviously I stick out, you know, I'm already a female. I already have a hairnet on and now I have a t-shirt, you know, <laughs> brutal. Yeah. So. Well, it's like, it's amazing to me, the level of detail even something like getting a singlet right takes, you know, you just kind of take it for oh, granted. Yeah. And then when you're in that process, that constant iteration and continuous improvement process, it, you know, I mean, I can't imagine how many times you guys went back and forth. You would think it'd be, you know, more simplistic than it is, but I'm always fascinated by things like that. Oh, for sure. I mean, the more I pay attention to like the business realm and anybody who's starting up a business and, you know, I'm a big fan of like black rifle coffee. Um, respect veteran yeah. Um, yeah and so i'm a big fan of that and i just you know i got like obsessed with like i'm reading the books that they've all written i'm like watching the videos and like just seeing how something can come about and you you know how much effort like comes into like the marketing of all these things you know it's like it's crazy once you get into the nitty-gritty of it all but i think that's why wrestlers should shine in the world after wrestling because if you have a goal you know you just got to you got to tackle it down. You got to work at it. And I think a lot of wrestlers have that discipline to be like, you know, because you're never going to shoot a million shots. Correct. You know, unless you continue to practice at it, you know, mm -hmm. if you want it to, you know, showcase in a match, you've got to put the work in. And so I think wrestlers really thrive in that business after wrestling life. No details too small. Um, have you, I know you're, you said you're a coffee fan. Have you ever had bulletproof coffee? No, I haven't. So it's where you take a cup of coffee pour it into a blender and you put in a tablespoon of butter and a tablespoon of coconut oil and splash some cinnamon in and then blend it. It's delicious. Okay. Every right, morning I have it. You got to try it. It's really I'm gonna good. I'm going to check that out. Yeah, no, that sounds right up my alley. I'm always on Pinterest looking up different things. <laughs> People are very creative. <laughs> now, 2014 was the year you made your first world team. And I've read that you said, you know, the pressure was was something you'd never felt before. And then in 2015, you had, as you call it, your worst season ever. Talk about that year and kind of looking back, maybe what you would have done differently or, or why you felt the pressure you did. Because, um, I mean, last year you made the world team, right? And you were back at the world championships in 2018 right. as well. But I just always find that interesting, kind of that, not a comeback story, but, you know, the, the peaks and valleys. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I have very, very low point, you know, after 14, like 15, 15, truly, in my opinion, was like my worst, you know, year. And it was just, um, a Why learning. Was it your worst I, year? I mean, I guess like, you know, you could look at my, uh, like, you know, I get I, in the finals again of the, of the nationals and then I lose. And then, you know, you go from being second and then you go to trials and I've been placed. And that was the first time I'd never not, you know, I've, I'd placed in high school. I, at, you know, the trials, like I made a, you know, a national team very young. And so to go, you know, in 2015 and not make a national team to not, you know, not even place, I won a match. I think I lost the two back to back. Um, so disappointing from a wrestling standpoint. And then, you know, just like where I was in life, I think I was really, you know, figuring myself out, right. You know, it was very difficult. And I think that's why I really preach this like authenticity and the things, you know, my interviews and all that, because, it's so important to everyone, you know, the more that you feel comfortable with yourself, the more that you're proud of yourself. And that is electric that, you know, spreads like wildfire and it's important. And I think no matter like what you're going through and it could be, it could be anything, you know, if you're not really being who, who you are and, and identifying with your core values, you know, of course you're going to be lost. You know, when I look back at that season, it's like, well, Jenna, like how can you expect that you didn't have a good wrestling season when you're like all over the place in life? You know, you're just not really not confident, super low self-esteem. And that was hard to deal with, especially in a sport that's like, Hey, toughen up. You're the, you got to think you're the best. And it's like, well, the truth is like not every day you're going to think you're, you're the best. And if you start feeling like, oh my gosh, on Tuesday, I felt awful. Now that's seeping into Wednesday and then Thursday and Friday. And then you just had like a week of not so good feelings. And then you're like not performing that can really lower your self-esteem. And so you've got to figure out how, okay, how can I bounce back? Like, just because I had a, a bad practice doesn't mean I'm a bad person. I don't like, I have a bad practice now. I just kind of laugh about it. There's been so many times in this past season where I'm like, I have a great day. I think I'm on top of the world. You know, I just, feeling myself. And then the next day I get my butt kicked and I feel super low. And I kind of laugh about it. And I'm always like, wow, wrestling is so crazy. It can humble you in an instant. <laughs> Isn't it funny how when you're younger though, 
it's life or death. And now you look back and you have some distance and you're like, what the hell was I thinking to get that upset about a wrestling match or whatever it was? Yeah. Oh, I see. I see it a lot of times, you know, like, um, kids put so much effort, you know, like I have to win Fargo. If I don't win Fargo, I'm never going to get recruited. If I don't get recruited my whole, you know, my whole life is over almost. And it's <laughs> like, I mean, of course, how can you perform under that pressure? That's intense. You know, like we talk about this, like my sports psych is also, he works with like special forces, um, soldiers, he works with Rangers, he works with, you know, athletes. And he's just been so crucial for my wrestling career. And so crucial for life outside of wrestling of just like, Hey, like you got to stay present, you know, like a lot of times everyone always wants to ask about the next thing coming up. Like what's the next thing. And of course that's like the job of the person. But for me, you know, I just give like, well, today's Monday. So I'm not thinking about Saturday, you know, like, why would I think, why would I think about Saturday? You know, it's, it's not here yet. And as I'm like going through that, it was funny. I was watching the Michael Jordan. Um, oh my God. I'm obsessed. Yeah, that whole thing was absolutely amazing. Oh my the, God. Yeah. Huge. And one of the things that they said, you know, he was like, everyone was taking the, the three shot, the three shots and they're missing. And, you know, Michael Jordan takes it, kills it. And everyone's like already nervous about it. And he was like, why would I think about a shot I haven't taken yet? And I was like, oh my God, that's like my, like, that's the stuff I work on, but it's just so mind blowing to hear it from, you know, such an elite athlete. And you're like, yeah, why would I think about, oh my God, what if I lose this match? Oh my God, what if I can't get to this? Like, why, why is your mind already there when it's, you know, it's Monday at two o'clock in the afternoon? <laughs> How do some people figure that out without any help from a, ther a therapist or a psychologist is a beyond me. That's why they're as good as they are. That's incredible. When he said, I do remember that. And I, it kind of registered my mind too, thinking how in the hell does he come to that at such a young age, you know? Definitely. And you know, it's funny, like Ellis, you know, you brought him up earlier. He's someone I always look to on our team. He's like one of our leaders and he's just a great advocate for staying present, you know, staying in a positive attitude. Like you just, you never find Ellis in a bad mood unless he's like losing at a video game or something, you know, <laughs> then he's probably a little salty, but he's never in a, in that mindset, you know, like he's always, I've been on so many trips with him when we're like getting delayed, things are happening. We lost our luggage, like all these things that would, you know, just throw a wrench in your plan. And he's just like, Oh, whatever. Like, I don't care. You know, he, like, I've seen him so many times saying like that and I'm such a planner and I'm like, mm. Ellis, like, don't you understand? Like, we're going to miss this connection. We're not going to get here. Like I'm stressed. And he's just like, Jenna, like, you can't think like that. And literally the more that I've been around him, like I, I love when I'm traveling with him and my coach Jermaine Hodge, because they're just two in the same, like they just, they don't worry about things like that. Like constantly they're like, why would I worry about things I can't control? And so easy to say that, but I don't, I still, I still <laughs> fail at it daily, you know? Yeah. Well, oh, me too. it's tough. Um, so Ellis is, you know, his, uh, I'm involved with Beat the Street Chicago loosely, and the executive director was Ellis's high school coach, and he's like this legendary Illinois coach, Mike Powell. Oh yeah, no, I'm familiar for sure. Um, yeah, he he just he has you know, just incredible things to say about Ellis, um, and I, I'm glad you spoke about him a little bit because you know a lot of times you don't hear everyone's story. Um, certainly, some of the you know the Greco guys you don't hear as much about. So I was that's cool you talked yeah. about him. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask about is. You know, when you look at your 2019 world team, and this you've you've done this interview, and a lot of people have talked about it. But at the U.S. Open, you lost to Becca 51 seconds, has how you say it. And yeah. in between the U.S. Open and Final X, you really put yourself through hell in different 51 second activities, mm -hmm. whether it was the Airdyne. Um, how did you border? How did you border not obsessing over? what you did in the 51 seconds versus kind of moving on and getting ready for the next thing. Uh, and just describe what happened maybe. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was very difficult, you know, I, and again, it's like, I went into the U S open just thinking like, this is mine. I've got this, you know, I declared myself at 57 kilos very early on. And I was just on the mindset of like, okay, I'm going to the world at this weight. I want to qualify the weight. And you know, when I went through that tournament, I was like tech falling my way. I, you know, I make it to the finals and not that I thought it was going to be easy by any means, because I know, you know, I, lo I know the level, but, I, you know, I had previously beaten Becca pretty, you know, handily before. And so I just was like, yeah, I just got to wrestle, you know, mm -hmm. and that was the game plan, just wrestle. And it was very loose. And of course, you know, when, when I get out there and I lose it in 51 seconds, you know, like I'm 
I'm devastated. Like, I just can't believe it. And we had such a stellar national championship. Like we pretty much everybody in WCAP, I think we had 12 people in the semis or, the, or maybe the finals. I can't remember. And everyone dominated. We had people like two people, you know, meeting in the, or, you know, two mm-hmm. WCAP people meeting in the finals. And so everyone was going home with hardware, you know, and to me, like, <laughs> like I'm going home with the small piece of hardware. Like I am pissed. You know, everyone on the plane has got their big plaque and I got the small one and everybody's happy, but me, you know, and some people finish and they get, they get third. So they're still happy. And I think, I think literally I was like the only one who got second. And so I was pissed, you know, I was like, Oh my God, I cannot believe I let the team down, like blah, 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 blah. I let myself down. And I just, you know, I punished myself for that 51 seconds. And, you know, I, at first I told myself like, okay, Jenna, just give yourself, get back to Colorado Springs and then you got to get your act together and let it go. And then I got back to Colorado Springs and I couldn't let it go. I just, I couldn't believe it. You know, I, I just, I know I put the work in and I was like, it just felt so like heartbreaking to me. Like, oh my God, I do everything right. Like, how did I let this slip, you know, between my fingers? And, um, how long did that last when you got back? Oh my God. It probably lasted all week. And then my coach, both all the whole coaching staff was basically like, you know, Jenna, you got to get it together. Like you can't, you can't be in these, these feelings of devastation. Like that's gone. Like you compete again in less than two weeks now, you know, because trials is right after Mm -hmm. uh, the open. And I remember coach Sean Lewis just said to me like, Hey, like you just expected it to happen. Like you didn't go out there and get it. Like you just thought the ref was just going to go in your favor And, you know, he said that to me and it really stuck out. And I was critical of myself. Like, no, I didn't, you know, I didn't do that. And the whole car ride home, I'm like, oh my God, like I did, like, I just expected everything to fall in my favor. And like, I didn't go get what was mine, you know? And so leading into the trials in Raleigh, North Carolina, to me, that was like a war path. Like I just, to me, I didn't want to be there. Couldn't believe I had to be there. Uh, you know, I wanted to have the buy to the finals. I kept seeing, you know, my teammates are like living it up. They're like, we're in final X, you know, and I still had to go get my final X medal. Like I still had to get myself there. And, you know, I just put myself through hell in that 51 seconds. Every, if I was doing treadmill sprints, I was doing multiple 51 seconds, air dime, you know, everything, everything I was you know, doing, I was punishing myself. And so when I got to Raleigh, to me, it was so personal. You know, I wanted to I wanted to tech fall every single person in my weight class to show that they just weren't on my level that like, even on my worst day, even when I don't feel good because I didn't feel good, you know, I didn't mentally feel good. I didn't, I was upset, you know, and I just wanted to prove that no matter what, even on my worst day, like they just still couldn't beat me. And so I had an attitude at, you know, a lot of people, I think it was uh, Ryan Holmes with flow wrestling. You know, he was like, you know, he's like, you looked a little different today. You know, you look like you were trying to prove something. And, you know, it was true. I really, I just brushed it off. Like, Hey, I'm a New Yorker. Like I just had, you know, I'm a little rough around the edges. Like, I don't care if these girls like me or not. I just, I want to destroy them. And so, you know, getting to final X. Um, and once I got the spot for that, I had to really, uh, tone it down because for me, I didn't want to go into final X angry. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to hate Becca, you know, that's mm-hmm. just like immature. I didn't want to be like, oh, I hate this girl. I got to destroy her. Cause that puts more pressure on myself. And so I just had to remain so present that thinking about the future, thinking about the match was so out of reach that I just, it wasn't attainable. And so every day leading it up until final X, I was saying so present of just like, I can't even think about Becca. Like I'm thinking about myself, making sure my body's right, making sure my weight's good, uh, getting my extra in. And so I remember getting ready for final X as we're there. And I remember seeing everybody like jumping around, you know, like everyone gets ready a certain way. And I remember, you know, just seeing people like slap themselves. And I remember like my favorite picture that Justin uh, Hawk captured was I'm just like, actually right before I go out, like my hands are right on my thighs and I'm just like super calm. Like there was no pump up. And I remember just, I love that he captured that picture because I was truly just staying like so insanely present, saying, sending all these positive vibes to myself and just knowing that like my body was going to do what it needed to do. Like I already had, I knew I already had a game plan. I knew how Becca wrestles. I, you know, I know what I wanted to hit, but I just knew like, okay, we just got to go with the flow and not be so nervous and, and enjoy the moment. You know, I was in New Jersey. I had all these people from Long Island and other parts of New York. They were rooting for me that I was like, well, how can I not go out there and have fun? Like it's going to do such a disservice to me and my family. So 
yeah, it was, it was a good, it was a good show up. <laughs> you are a, an incredible lesson and you just mental presence. And you have a lot of insights on that. I, I could hear about it all day. I think it's just fascinating that you've honed your skills over your, your mental skills, not your wrestling skills, you know, really since it sounds like 2004, 2005, uh, not 2000, 20, 2014 until now, you know, when yeah. you had that, that first world team. And, and truly, I, to be honest, you know, it was really from 20, some part of 2018 until now where I've really, you know, started working with a certain sports psychologist and, um, you know, cause 2014, I was so young and so like, almost didn't really understand that like I deserve to be here. Like I made the team, but I just felt like, Oh, I'm 20, I'm 21 years old. You know, I'm fresh out of junior. I was like, what can I do here? And I wish, you know, if I could go back, I wish I would tell myself all these things of like, why are you, why are you caring what anybody thinks? Like, why do you care? You know, like you just have to stay, you know, like so present, like don't miss the opportunity. Like what I've learned now is the more time I waste being nervous or anxiety ridden is like, I'm wasting energy, you know, like I need that energy later on in a match. And so I had to really hone in on that. And that's, that's really been the past, you know, two years. And it, it showcased a lot when I went to Italy at that world ranking event. Um, and so that was right before my rest loss. I think, so that was the event right, right after I graduated from my military school, went there and, you know, I, I got fifth there, but I wrestled my first match was the Russian that I lost to at the world championships. Yeah. And so I remember getting that draw and being like, oh, that's hilarious. Like I would have this female first match. And I just remember being so thankful. Like I can't wait to kick her ass so I can show that I should have won at world. You know, it should have been me. Um, and I just Heck was yeah. so excited for that opportunity. And, and that was a great tournament because it, your matches happened every 10 minutes, literally. Like yep. we had a lot of times where we were waiting at the clock just to make sure we got our 15, like, a lot of minutes. And I remember just not even getting the opportunity to be nervous because we just had to keep going. And I was, I was super grateful for that event because I was able to really practice the things that I was working on mentally, practice the things that I was working on physically. And so um, that was another good showcase of, you know, staying sharp mentally. Isn't it amazing how when you get to the level you're at, it truly is, it's such a cliche, and I, I'm going to say it, but I hate to, 90% mental, 95% mental, but, but man, I mean, just like everything you've said today is just uh, you know, a, a real example of the mental battle day in and day out is incredible. And you look at someone like JB, how has he done it for that long? Or anyone who's done it, Helen, or anyone who's done it consistently for is sure, like yeah. unbelievable, you know? Yeah. And I think one thing that I like, you know, I observe of like, you know, Jordan Burroughs is, you know, he's, um, you know, he's with his family, he's doing different things. You know, he doesn't have to stay in this mindset of like, can you imagine if Jordan Burroughs just like thought he was only a wrestler and that's all he was going to do? Like things would be, you know, his financial situation, all that would be so much pressure. And instead, like he's living his life, he's impacting the community. Like, I don't know how much I can stress that of how important what, you know, the black wrestling association, like what all that is doing. And I think, you know, for me, like I have noticed personally, like I have really the last few months tried to put so much, you know, I'm not trying to chew my horn, but I just wanted to put good into the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, without even like saying like the things that I w was doing, all of a sudden a lot of good things were happening. And I was like, wow, like this is insane. Like it really truly, you know, shows that, the attitude you put out is the attitude you get back. And, you know, obviously sometimes bad things happen and I'm not saying like, Oh, something bad happens to you. You deserve it somewhere right. down the line. It's just, that's life. But if you can learn to take a little bit out of these hard times and these opportunities and to find growth somewhere, your wrestling will be so much better because you're like, Oh, six minutes on a mat. Like, okay. Like I've got my, you know, I've got some friends that are deployed right now. Like how can I worry about six minutes on the mat when I've got people you know, and friends overseas and people doing other really hard things away from their family. And so uh, for me, it's very humbling just knowing like, hey, my time wrestling is such a short window and it's such an opportunity. Like, I don't want to, the rest of my career, I don't want to waste a second of it. Like even the crappy days, like I want to find something good about it so that when I am in the real world, you know, I'll miss those days of like, wow, I can't believe those days when I was just on the mat wrestling six minutes at a time. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I mean, I will say, you know, of the, of some of the things you've been doing lately, I, I can imagine one of them is maybe that campaign, how she wrestles. I love yeah. those videos. I think they're oh, awesome. Good. 
the, I'm glad, yeah. The confidence one was awesome. And then uh, the vulnerability one, I, I just think that's such a, a cool idea to do that. Who, who started that? That was all Julia Salata. I, she, she contacted a few of us and we just bounced ideas off of each other. And then she kind of brought in the scope and uh, invited more people to do it. And we're continuing to um, invite more people. Like, you know, we just want to hear everyone's story. You know, we want to hear the male coaches, we want to hear the female coaches, you know, referees. Like, we just want to know and so we can share those stories because, you know, not everyone is on a podcast. Not everyone gets to share a little bit. And so, it's been uh, so nice to hear everybody's stories, everybody's journeys. You know, I truly like, I can't wait to hear more and more of the females that paved the way because their life was mm. so different than the high schoolers today, you know? Oh my God. We were just talking, I had Victoria Anthony on last week and we were talking about Trisha Saunders. Um, oh my God. Yeah. That, that's the old, oh, that's OG. I mean, that's <laughs> incredible. <laughs> that is, I mean, I, I don't even know when, you know, mid nineties, maybe early 90s but you think back to that that's and then you know the first olympics for female wrestling 04 04 yeah right i mean that's that's incredible how far how far it's come um yeah the topic i wanted to wind down with is you have you're very outspoken in support of autism awareness and i don't know the answer to this so i'm excited to know why why is that and how did that come to be so, um, my, I have an older brother, he's five years older than me and, you know, he's autistic and he was diagnosed when he was two years old and, you know, it's just like, I, I grew up with it. So I have this awareness of, of it and I just, you know, like I've always been outspoken of it. My family has always had this like chip on their shoulders because, you know, like a lot of people would stare at us, you know, we'd go, there was no event or anything we could do that people weren't staring at. Like my brother was very energetic you know he was very loud he was always jumping around making noise and so people just stared because if you don't know about it you can't expect you know like i can't expect you to have understanding if you don't even know what autism is and right. so 30 years you know or 31 years ago when my my parents had my brother you know he, it was so new i remember people even when i was coming up you know people thought it was a disease people thought they could catch autism and that was such a battle. You know, I remember like people like, you know, kids in my class, they're like, I remember their parents didn't want them to come because they didn't want them to be around my brother. And I just, I was so hurt from it. And I had this mindset of like, you know what, Josh, to hell with these people. If they don't want to understand you, they are missing out because, you know, my brother is such a loving, um, incredible, caring person, you know, and if you just if you just check him off as he's autistic and he can't speak, you're, you're missing out on all this unconditional love that he gives by showing you. And so, um, it's always been so important in my life. You know, I just wanted, I wanted my brother to be accepted, like the, all these people with disabilities and everybody, you know, like at the end of the day, we all just want to be accepted and we have that in common. You know, I want to be accepted just as much as I want my, you know, for my brother to be accepted. So, I started that since I was, you know, younger, I've always been a big advocate for my brother, you know, because he can't speak. And so I can quickly gauge what my brother needs. And uh, my mom has worked, uh, she worked in the disability field for, gosh, over 40 years, you know, she was one working in group homes, she was writing programs for these adults. And for me, it's really important about the adults with disabilities, adults with autism, because a lot of times if they're kids, it's like, oh, they're so cute. Like, look at them. Like, I love the noise they make. And then when they become an adult, a lot of people have a hard time accepting like, oh man, like, you know, if you saw my brother, he looks normal. And then all of a sudden you hear him make a noise and you're like, oh my God, like, you know, right, and, right. yeah, and I, I, I could talk about this all day. I'm just like, I'm passionate about it. I really want adults with disabilities, adults with autism to have somewhere, you know, after they age out of the system, after they're 21 plus, or, you know, like a lot of these kids, they either live with their parents and their parents hold that, you know, I don't want to say burden, but it's a ch more challenging of a lifestyle. Right. And so they either have to have that or they go into a group group home themselves. And that's like, that's a hard pill to swallow. And I just encourage a lot of people to start, you know, they ha when they have a child with disability, like they have to think of their future. You know, I remember being five years old being like, mom, I'm going to take Josh. Like I, I will not let my brother go into a home. And I remember my mom thinking like, or she would say, she'd be like, Jenna, don't feel obligated. Like you don't have to have, you know, you don't have to do that. Like that's, it's not your life. If you didn't 
choose that. And I'm like, well, like I didn't choose this blessing, but I have it, you know, I'm not going to like, I won't personally, you know, I won't personally do that, but I try to put my, my brother in a good situation and my parents do as well to make sure he's in a routine. He has a good work program. Um, and he has all these, uh, great situations where he's going to thrive. And so, Mm -hmm. uh, just, it's very important. And I hope people from, you know, my channels of social media have, you know, seen it and just have an understanding. That's all anybody wants in this world is just like a little bit more of an understanding, you know? Well, you threw out a tweet. I don't know when it was, but it just very simple things on what people can do. And I was like, man, that really stuck with me for a couple of days. I think it was something like, you know, look at me in the eyes, even, you know, something like who wouldn't do that. But then you think, you know, I'm probably guilty of that. You know, I'm sure a lot of people are. So I just thought oh, that was sure. pretty cool to, I don't know if you remember any of, the other, any of the other things you mentioned there, but that you want to share, but it was pretty impactful. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's like, it's really interesting because you, you'll come across all types of people in life and, you know, they could be on a weird wheelchair, they could have a missing limb. And I think a lot of people assume like, oh my God, that's such a tragedy. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. You have to live like that. And, you know, obviously I don't have these disabilities, but from what I've learned, from what I've, you know, spoken to these individuals and, you know, studied on is that, you know, they don't want to be treated like that. Like, you know, they want to be respected and seen, you know, eye to eye, don't act like this is a burden. And, you know, one of the disability studies classes that I had in college, um, if you really look, look at the structure of a building or a house, you know, you start to really like, for me, I think about it all the time. Like, oh my gosh, like those stairs are super steep. Like what is someone going to do if they're in a wheelchair? And then sometimes businesses now, because legally they have to, they'll have a different entrance, but sometimes the ramps are just like an immediate drop. And you start to look at the structure and you're like, that would be dangerous. Like it's a ramp. So technically it's okay, but you know, it's, that's not good for anyone. And so after that class in college, you know, cause my brother is obviously not physically disabled. Um, I, you know, so that, that class even opened my eyes of like, wow. And then you start thinking of like, imagine when you're going overseas, imagine the Paralympians mm-hmm. when they go to these countries and you know, it's not uh, sustainable for them. Like the Olympic training center was guilty of it for a long time. I remember like, the um, elevator to go up the stairs so you could go to the cafeteria was so far out of the way. Mm. And now they finally have it where right next to the restroom, you've got the stairs and you've got an elevator. And so I remember when that changed over and I don't remember what year it was, but I remember thinking like, okay, that's a good improvement. And I was just like thinking to myself like, wow, I can't believe all the years that these Paralympians had to live here. And like the uh, accessible parking would be so far, you know, it's just like, little things like that. And I think the more I talk about it now, because social media is such a platform where you can get things out in an instant, people can share it. And I've always had these thoughts for a long time. And now I'm like, you know what, it would benefit someone to know, oh, I probably should talk to the individual instead of like, I hate when people talk to my mom or me about my brother, like it, it's rude, you know, like, I understand that there's certain things where like, he's not going to have a full conversation with you. But my brother is very smart and he can pick up on a lot of things. He's very like mischievous. And so, you know, it's just like common courtesy to be like talking to my brother, not about my brother, you know? It's amazing how much you can communicate without language in situations like that. Definitely. Oh, for sure. I'm I'm really glad you shared that. Um, And I want to thank you for your time. Our last question is always how did wrestling impact your life or how did wrestling change your life? Hence the name of the show. Yeah. You're, st- you're still in it. And hopefully we see you going through 2024, but, um, you know, how would you say, you know, pretty simply, how would it, how did wrestling impact your life or what, what, what do you take with you to this day? I think I'll always take the, like, you know, the work ethic and the discipline that wrestling has. I, I'm sure that's like a common answer of just, you know, like it instills that in you and it, it gives you that confidence and, I think that's important, you know, because we're in an individual sport. And so you don't have the offense or the defense to have your back. Like you've got to have your back. And I think if you take that sentiment with you the rest of your life, like, Hey, there's certain things that I got to go out of my way to make sure that I get this done. You know, I have to do this. I, I have to seek out, you know, information. Like I'm really big about just saying like, yeah, I don't know everything. I'm not, I'm not the best wrestler. One day I might be the best wrestler on April 10th and make the Olympic team, but it doesn't mean I'm the best wrestler every day of my life. And I think that's just, that's how it's changed my life. It's, it's given me this humility to know like, Hey, ask the right questions, put yourself in the right situation. You know, there's always room to grow. And so truly thankful for the sport, for just giving me all those disciplines in life to take with me and be successful when I'm done wrestling. Well, and the sense of presence that you have, I'd be hard pressed to think that you would have never been put in situations where you had to learn that without 
wrestling and i'm sure you you would have learned it on your own but i mean at i mean and you're still mastering you know having yeah. presence so to speak but that seems like a big thing for you as well oh for sure yeah I, there's so many things <laughs> just thankful for it all <laughs> for sure well thank you very much for your time we're excited to see you back out there and, and really appreciate you doing the show here heck yeah yeah thank you ryan for doing this and having me on i appreciate it and all great things must come to an end if you want to hear more from the podcast text wrestle to 555-888 that's Wrestle to 555-888. You can also find us on Instagram, Wrestling Changed My Life, Twitter, Ryan underscore N underscore Warner, as well as our website, WrestlingChangeMyLife.com. Take care, y'all. Come. 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 Take care, y'all.